Yeah, you know that I am Tanya, and you know that I have two of my favorite people with me every Thursday night. So please welcome out Lee Cuthbert and Scoop Dawson. Hey, Here they Tanya. Come. Hello, Lee. How are you? I am well. It was beautiful in the ATL today. It was so nice. So nice. It was so, we're seeing like a different section of your home tonight. Yeah, I'm in my office. I, I just, I, I don't know why. I, I moved from my kitchen. It's not better. It's just different. And I think at this point, different is what I'm after. It's good. Yeah. Different is good, right? Scoop, you and I are clearly in the same location, as everyone can tell by our background that is in no way virtual. This is 100% real background. Authentic. Um, authentic. <laughs> That's right. Name brand name brand y'all um so you know lee brought up a very good point she just said that different is you know good right now right so um i know a lot of people are probably looking for some different things to do different places to go in atlanta right are you guys looking for some different things to do because i am yeah, so because of that, I have a two very, you are two, oh, wonderful. Because of that, I have two very special guests with us tonight who are going to tell us about the hidden gem of Sandy Springs, the big trees, the big forest. If you would, please welcome out from the North Fulton Master Gardeners, Catherine Coppage and Tom Redman. Give it up for them. Here they come. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Tanya. Hello, Lee. Hello, Hello Scoop. Tom. Hello. Nice to be with you all. <laughs> awesome. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much. So uh, I wanted to start out, and I want you guys, because it really is one of the hidden gems of Sandy Springs in the Atlanta area, I wanted to know if you guys could talk about exactly where the Big Trees Forest is. Where is it located? Hi, hey, Tanya. Um, yeah, I'm Catherine. I'm a master gardener. I'm also on the board of Big Trees. I've been on the board since 2006. And it is this wonderful 30-acre, like you say, urban gym that is smack dab on Roswell Road. And people have mm -hmm. said to me, oh, you're at Big Trees? You work at Big Trees? You you plant um Flowers of Big Trees, where is that? And I go, well, it's right next to the annex where you get your car tags on Roswell Road. There's something there? I went, yes, there's a whole forest there. It's this beautiful forest. So it's right there on Roswell Road, just south of Morgan Falls um, Road. Um, and it's right across from the Mercedes and the Cadillac dealership. And there's a big marquee sign right on the road. So it's kind of hard to miss, but... You know, and when we're in our cars, we're just traveling up and down kind of mindless. So you don't really see what's to the left and to the right. But anyhow, Big Tree, it's actually called the John Ripley Forbes by the fellow that was instrumental in cobbling together this 30-acre parcel because it was going to be another car dealership in, in 1989. That's what it was slated to become. And Tom's going to tell us more about that. But it's 30 acres right on Roswell Road. It's a former cotton farm or plantation. And um, there are actually 21 acres of forested property and 10 acres is the building and the two parking lots. So it's right there, really easy access, free parking. You just pull in, you don't have to pay for parking. The park is, um, it's, it's amazing because it's a passive park, which means there, there are no swing sets. There's not a dog park, there's not an auditorium, so there's no swimming there, unless you want to swim in the creek which you can do because the creek is now not dead any longer. Um, but anyhow, there's seven trails that, that go throughout the park, and it's just it's this beautiful forest that, you know, I go every week or every other week, and I have for years because there's just so much there to not do. In our lives where we're doing and doing and doing and doing and doing, you just get to walk through the forest and not do. And we're really excited because last month we got invited to be included in the Old Growth Forest Network, which is a really fabulous new um, organization. And they're protecting old growth forest 
throughout the United States, and they're trying to get, their mission is to get an old growth parcel in every county, and there are over like 3,500 counties in the country, and some of them aren't going to be suited to that, but they think they're going to get about 75% of the counties to have a parcel, and when the forest is designated old growth forest, the network, it can never be logged, it can never be cut, it can never be disturbed or destroyed. So it's another way to um, protect these beautiful, beautiful bits of land that and forests that we have that um, otherwise might become parking lots. You know, the other thing about the big trees is that it is, it is one of 16 parks in Sandy Springs. Sandy Springs has about 950 acres in green space. And for a city of 88,000 people, that's either not quite enough or just right. I don't know. But it's what we have. And Big Trees is, we're glad that Big Trees is part of the park system there. So, again, it's a, the, the street address is 7645 Roswell Road. And it's a tree and plant and wildlife sanctuary. And it's just, it's, it's gorgeous. It's a great place for families, a great place for for people to bring their dogs, it's um, it's safe. It's open seven days a week from dawn to dusk. And it's my favorite spot to go undo. I love that. So um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the reason we are talking about big trees right now is because the North Fulton Master Gardeners, they are having, um, you guys have a very extensive web learning series. And this Sunday, you actually have a webinar, a, a chance to learn more in depth about the Big Trees Forest. And I believe Lee has put links and information in our Twitch chat stream for you guys to have, to uh, look at, and you know, to register for this class. Um, so Tom, I wanted you to tell us a little bit of the history, a little bit of the history. Uh, thanks, Tanya. <clears throat> it's got a great history. Uh, as with most histories that are for the benefit of the public, this one, of course, starts with a real hero. And uh, Catherine mentioned his name, John Ripley Forbes. Uh, there's a great book. Uh, here's a picture of John. I think that you kind of get the sense of he's an outdoors kind of guy. Uh, he's already out in the woods. He's my dad's age, which means he was born in uh, 1913. And his whole life uh, really was the putting together of a remarkable number of nature sites, especially for children. Uh, John Forbes really had an inclination uh, toward helping kids get back into the woods. Um, you'll know that there are once in a while, uh, some good programs and good books that talk about, um, oh my goodness, we're not getting kids connected to nature. Well, John was able to do the much harder work of actually helping to create the funding for what was very specifically about 20 big parks for children across the country, but he was instrumental in almost 200 parks uh, in his fundraising activities. And Big Trees was really his culminating um, last big effort to find a really good quality park that still had a whole forest at work, uh, a forest that kids could learn in and have a great time in. So that was going to be my question to you. You said that, you know, he really had a thing for, you know, children, parks for children, but there are no like swing sets or anything like that. So I'm guessing it was more for, he really wanted to educate them about nature more so than giving them somewhere to just play on equipment. Tanya, you're right on it. That's exactly his purpose. Uh, he thought there were plenty of places with swing sets. What he wanted was a place where kids could see dirt and see soil at work creating amazing trees. And he also really had a sense of how the entire forest worked together in our history, as well as in the modern times that kids get away a little bit from the forest. So he really wanted to get kids back into what might be called the original sense of a forest or a nature center. He also 
Don't forget, he was also involved in nature centers that were not necessarily in great big forests like big trees, but he also had a great uh, sense of wanting to work with public schools and helping teachers to find parks and nature as real teaching places. So what drove this in him? I mean, he sounds like a very uh, interesting fella. Do you know what really drove this in him, this desire to bring people sort of back to nature? And it almost seems like to initiate this love for nature at a very young age. What drove this? I, I think it was just literally his uh, early on, almost as a teenager, sense that unless the country, uh, which was at a different time back in the early 20s and in the 30s, uh, unless people really began to start taking care of nature, in other words, building these places where children could find good teaching experiences, learning experiences, you just wouldn't get it. And, and his whole notion was that we've got to keep what we've got. Um, the book I just showed you his picture from is titled Nature's Keeper. And if anything, John was a nature keeper. He wanted to make sure just as Catherine mentioned, that when you could put together funding to get hold of and put in trust so it can't be otherwise used up to around 30 acres of property, you've really done something for the public and you've given them a place to walk, uh, to think, uh, to be quiet in the midst of a big, busy city. It's a remarkable place. And John felt like uh, his whole life this has to be done or we're going to lose it. So um, I want to give a, a shout out to my girl, Lee Tenenbaum, really quick. Hey, Lee. Um, and I want to ask you, because one thing that she really emphasized when I spoke to her and also my girl, Sandy Shave, hey, Sandy, um, is they emphasize that this park is really good for children with like young, young, young children, families with young children, that the walking trails are not too much, that there's just a lot for them to do. Was this part of his plan? Was it always part of his plan to keep it accessible, to make it easy for young kids to navigate? Always. Uh, his whole feeling about the parks and the nature centers was that if kids can't get to them, and get to them in places where kids ne didn't necessarily have good ways to get to nature before, other than their backyards. But it, without that, without that accessibility, these places really wouldn't do the good things they could do to help kids learn about nature and to develop a sense of needing to keep it and protect it. Uh, for instance, when Catherine and I, and we're colleagues on the board with about five other people who helped to watch over it, keep the trails fixed and so forth. Uh, when we take kids and their adult supervision out into the forest, we can do some remarkable things in a very small amount of time to help children begin to see that the forest is a place they can learn things they never thought they could learn before. So it's almost like a teaching laboratory for kids. That's so great. So, um, I wanted to, to know, um, this is what's interesting to me, and this is, you know, a little bit off of the big trees topic, but it all kind of circles back around. So in Atlanta, when people think of green space and parks, much like New York City, they all think of Piedmont Park, where in New York, everybody thinks of Central Park. Would you say that, you know, this is one of the hidden green spaces in Atlanta that people don't know about but should? Because are there different types of nature there they can see, different types of trees there they can see? What makes this so special other than the fact that it's really in the heart of Sandy Springs? Well, being in the heart of Sandy Springs is no small thing. <clears throat> Just to have this kind of place where you can actually get into the heart of it. And Catherine mentioned uh, there are two streams that meet to form a stream that also goes into the Chattahoochee. But if you can find a place where a child can with adults with them uh, in the deep part of the forest suddenly realize that with these big uh, industries all around, 
with schools, with a four lane road, Roswell Road, if you can get to a place and all of a sudden it's very quiet, it makes you start thinking, well, wait a minute, why can't I hear those things? And so you can begin to talk about some of the things that are of value in the forest that help us realize if we lose this, we have really lost something. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yes, Lee. You're on mute. You have to eat a spoonful of cornstarch. <laughs> no, I don't want to do that. Um, are dogs allowed in the park? Yes, dogs are allowed in the park. They're supposed to be on leashes at all time. Okay. Some on the backcountry trails, I see dogs not on leashes, and we've never had a problem to date. But dogs are welcome there. But I just want to let people know there is no dog poop fairy that comes and picks up the very carefully tied up bags of dog poop that you leave alongside the trail. And I, I did have, I was there a couple of months ago, and I took pictures of eight bags of dog poop that were just stuck in crevices and behind <laughs> rock stuff, like the hidden Easter eggs that we've forgotten. So please bring your dogs but please take the bags out. Thank you. No dog poop fairy. And there, and as <laughs> Catherine said, there are also very good receptacles to put it in at the beginning front part of the park near the restrooms. Awesome. Yes, Scoop. Uh, did, you, uh, did they notice that it was, did, was there an uptick in people actually going to the parks ever since uh, coronavirus came around? Or like, was it still oh, the same? Good. It was lovely. It was, there were, all of a sudden, the floodgates opened. Now, the, the park, Sandy Springs did close the park down initially while we were all trying to understand, you know, how to contain the coronavirus. And But then, once schools and businesses, businesses started slowing down and stopping and closing, it was a wonderful thing to see the parking lot filled with cars, with families and 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 dogs and people, uh, it was lovely. It was it was it was a dream come true for me because I'm there all the time. And the, the we have very, for the park its size and where it is, we have very low or haven't until recently a very low traffic pattern. And it was it was great to see everybody out. So yay, come come visit. And scoop these uh, uh, these folks who come to the preserve are generally very small groups. Uh, sp well spaced out, they sort of space themselves out, generally mask wearing, and you're outside. And so you're really away from a lot of what might cause some kind of um, accidental infection. Yes, Lee, did you have a question? I saw your hand. I did, yeah. I just wanted to talk for a minute about old growth trees. I understand that these trees are 100 to 200 years old. And I guess that constitutes old growth. Um, how many places like this are left around Metro Atlanta that have trees that old? Tom, do you know? I'm going to take that. I, I would say, and, and Catherine add to this, but I'm aware of a few of the other parks that have trees, generally speaking, large white oak trees that probably are in the realm of 200 to 250 years. <clears throat> that's about <clears throat> that's about as old and large a tree that can survive an urban environment. It's not that they couldn't grow a little bit longer, but that's already back to basically the signing of the constitution. So these are these are considered probably some of the oldest trees in Atlanta and they deserve that kind of special recognition. There's one See, great thing about them being in a forest. They're much less susceptible to development and the kind of legal hassles that go through when suddenly um, there is a very old tree found on a very valuable piece of property. So uh, let me ask you a question. So if they're less susceptible to things like that, I know that trees can also get disease. Are they also, since they're sort of in this forest, this protected area, are they less susceptible to diseases as well? Well, there's a, there, that's, I'm glad you asked that. There is a whole new system of thinking about how trees and forests within, trees within a forest 
communicate with, with, with each other and survive. And there's a great book called The Hidden Life of Trees by P Peter Wollaby. And um, he's, he was a, a German forester, and he has described this incredible world that we know very little about, where the trees in the forest are all connected to each other and talk to each other through the mycelium, which is the fungal network underneath the trees. And the trees actually communicate in terms of scent and mechanical movement. They actually, they, they, they have been able to, to detect them trembling, making a, a you know, just moving. Um, and then with the, they talk to each other through the mycelium network and feed each other. I mean, in forests, like trees in groups of species take care of each other. Now they don't want the other species moving in. So it's this incredible um, kind of race to the top for light because they need light to photosynthesize to, to make their food. But then evidently they share food with their tree babies. So it's, it's a fascinating. So it's and like their yes, own little community, their own family. They're connected and they and they communicate and take care of each other. And they do things like they, the, the pheromones in a forest, if one tree gets attacked by um, aphids or beetles or something, the tree sends off a distress, a distress signal and the other trees emit pheromones or they actually can emit something into their bark that makes the bark toxic for these beetles. So it's, it's, it's just, it's a brand new way of thinking about how the forest works. And I think it's fascinating. And there actually, there's a, there's a forest in Oregon that has a, it's 2,400 acres of this mycelium connection. It's 660 tons of one organism in, that makes it the largest organism on planet earth. And it's a forest in Oregon. I'm not making this up. The Hidden Life of Trees. That's really awesome. I mean, this is like super cool. So this was a book that you read. Now, I'm going to um, segue because you mentioned a book that you read in book club. And um, I found it very interesting when I learned about something called forest bathing. Forest bathing. Okay. I, I, I want you to tell us about that. And explain it to us. Okay. Well, there are no bathing caps or bathing suits are involved in this. And actually, it's the the Japanese term is called Shinrin Yoku, and it's the practice of bathing in the forest or taking in the atmosphere of the forest through your senses. Um, and I first heard about it a couple of years ago. And um, when I go out into a forest, usually I'm going from point A to point B. I'm getting there as fast as I can. It's exercise for me until I understood that this is a whole different concept. And when I slowed down, it was not jogging or moving through the forest or, or doing trail maintenance or something. There's an entirely different experience. So it's not exercise, it's not hiking, and it's certainly not jogging. And it is not documenting what you're doing either. So you don't take your trusted cell phone in to take pictures to show people what you're doing. You're experiencing it as you're moving through the forest without anything between you and the forest. Um, it's simply being in nature and connecting it, connecting to nature with our senses, with our five senses. And it's a slow amble through the forest. Um, Dr. Lee says, you know, a two hour wander with, and it's aimless too. You, you basically find a forest that, that can sustain two hours of you walking through it. And you do just that. You go in and drop the world away. Stop, you know, stop what you, you don't bring your agenda into the forest. You get to the forest and take some deep breaths and just move through the forest slowly. And in two hours, it's amazing what you can, what I, what I try, what I like to do when I take people in forest bathing sojourns is think about using your, your, your five senses this way. What five things can you see? What four things can you hear? 
and you go through and what what um, three things you can, can you um, smell? What two things? And you go you go through your senses and actually think about it for a moment. I mean, there's something totally different about going up and feeling the bark of a tree versus finding a tree back in the forest and sitting down and leaning against it and just leaning against the tree. It's a totally, totally different um, sensation. So, you know, it's, it's a wonderful way to, to communicate with the forest in a different way. And it's amazing that Dr. Lee has found that it does an amazing job of reducing our, our stress levels and our anxiety, and, you know, we are 93% of us spend 93% of our time in boxes. We're in our homes, we're in our schools, we're in our, you know, we're in our workplace, um, and then 6% of that 93%, we're in cars, so we're enclosed, and that's not how these hominids were meant to be. I mean, it's, it's really increased our stress level, and you know, decreased our ability to enjoy things, enjoy life. So getting actually stop, getting outside and walking through a forest is a huge stress reliever. And one of the other things he found out was that it increases your NKs, which are your natural killer immune response. Those are actually cells called natural killers. And it increases our cancer fighting ability to just being outside and he did another he, he's done a lot of stories he's, um, studies he's been doing this since the 80s he found out he took groups of, of people in japan on walks through urban areas through cities same amount of time same number of people and there is a benefit to getting outside and just walking anywhere but in he was able to quantify and qualify how much stress level, lower in blood pressure, lower, lower blood pressure, lower stress levels by being in the forest. It has a lot to do with the pheromones that the forest emits. And one of the most amazing things was he found the, the scent of cedar because a lot of the forests in Japan are, they're mostly made, they're mostly consist of cedar trees. And that scent in itself had the greatest effect on reducing stress. So cedar essential oils, people, I'm, I'm telling you, it's gonna be the next thing. Wow. I mean, that sounds like super cool. I, I, I like that. Scoop, I think you and I and Lee, I think we should all go and do some forest <laughs> bathing one day. Yeah, I, I, I actually uh, stay stay like pretty close to, to the, uh, to, to it. That's the yeah, outdoor I from this Oh, you're right really here. Yeah. Awesome. You there, Scoop? <laughs> yeah, I can remember. I mean, we don't get out. Yeah, Lee, what you got? No, no, I'm sorry. I just was wondering how many miles of trails is there? Um, if somebody's an avid hiker, will they be able to get enough exercise here? Well, there, there are seven different trails. The longest loop is about three quarters of a mile. So it's not excessive when I go if I really want to if I want to exercise then I do that trail about three times and there's topography so there's there's an elevation gain of about 120 feet which is like climbing a 12-story building so you you there is some topography but if it depends on what your level of exercise is when I when I usually go hike in the woods I'm gone I usually go to Gold Branch or um, Island Ford or Victory Creek because about five miles is what I like to hoof. So you can be done at big trees, but big trees is, you know, at 21 acres, it's it's doable, but you'd have to repeat the loop a couple times. So 21 acres, you guys have mentioned that a couple of times. For people who don't understand like quite what this size would be, what is something you could compare that to? Like how many city blocks would that equal? What is that? Tom, you have any idea? When I, when I think about um, the width and length of the forest, and it's not a square, it's what you might call a, a funny looking rectangle in a way, or a, an oblong, uh, I would say that it's probably about 12 to 15 blocks wide, maybe 20 blocks long. Okay. Uh, now that's going from some experience I have in trying to walk the avenues of New York. Uh, Atlanta doesn't quite have that same kind of thing. 
but it does give you an idea that it's about that size. Uh, somebody asked me, okay, how many football fields could you put in uh, to big trees? I'm guessing around 30 or 40. It's, it's good size. Wow. So yeah. uh, it, there's a lot of room in there. And as Catherine said, they're different trails. So little, very little kids can actually maneuver uh, and walk one whole trail without seeing the same thing probably in about 10 to 15 minutes. Or you can spend a lot of time. I love that. So um, I want to know, uh, to wrap up, why should someone take this course? What are they going to learn on Sunday? And um, these cor courses are provided as like a service to the community, and it's a great, great service to the community. Why should people sign up and take this? If you guys could sort of give your play on that, and then Lee is going to sing us a little song about big trees afterwards. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I can give you I can give you a thumbnail sketch. the The main educational purpose of taking this class or finding out more about big trees is you learn the pluses and minuses of human impact on water quality in the forest community. You know, because we having human impact has some thumbs up, has some thumbs down. You learn about forest dynamics, what creatures live in the forest, how they all um, communicate with with each other, and, it, and again, it's. It's this one beautiful, big community of plants and animals. One of the great things about, about big trees is it's part of the watershed for the Chattahoochee River. And by that, I mean, it, 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 when, when it rains, the rain doesn't just go straight down to the ground. It hits the tree canopy. It slowly filters down to the forest. It doesn't make huge rivulets and um, increase the erosion in on in the ground because that's the one that's the main thing that causes degradation of soil is erosion from water. So there's a lot going on about water. And it's the aquifer recharging because when it rains, again, it slows down the movement of water and it has a chance for the aquifers to refill that end up in the Chattahoochee, which is where we get all of our water from. from. It also um, is really instrumental in temperature regulation. When you see areas in, the, in an urban area that are that have no vegetation, they're a lot hotter. They have this microclimate, and, and the wind picks up. I mean, it's detrimental when you when you when you when you move the, remove the vegetation from an area. Um, it's habitat. It's a habitat for all kinds of mammals and reptiles and amphibians and the birds. The birds are in different layers, and they each each species kind of hangs out in a different part of the forest. So when you walk through, you see different birds flitting back and forth. Um, you know, so those are some of the things that that we um, encourage people to understand. And there's also a 15-point self-guided tour that has things you'll find out about return to forest health and the the two creeks that were in that exist in big trees at one point in the 80s, they were totally dead from silt runoff upstream and poor practices from building and all the runoff from all the, the asphalt and the parking lots and stuff, it just killed the, the, the streams were dead. And once that was taken care of, they started, the stream started coming back to life. So it's wonderful to see these groups of kids down in the creek, you know, finding salamanders and crayfish and little minnows and stuff because it's vibrant and alive and it's so exciting to see them go, Look, Mom, look what I found. So, you know, like Tom was saying, it's amazing for to see kids just just see how their world works in a different way. Um, and another thing is that it's, like we said earlier, it's passive recreation. There are no swing sets. You actually go and do, and, you know, it's hands-on. You get to go in, you can, you can touch the leaves, you can move stones around, you can, you know, it's, it's, it's something... It's not done to you. You have to actually participate in walking through the forest, and you know that's that's a totally different thing. So, yes. So, yeah, I, think. I would just add one quick uh, comment and a sort of a story. Um, I was with a very good friend who was a very wise teacher, older teacher, and after we came out toward the entrance, as we had finished a thirty-minute or so walk, he said, "You know, Tom." I could teach the entire upper class 
high school level curriculum in this forest, including art and literature. Wow. We, it, I thought that was pretty impressive from a person who really does know high school curriculum. Wow. That's awesome. I love that. So um, everybody, sign up for this webinar. It's Sunday. Um, this has been so cool. Like the stuff you learn, like these trees, they're a community. They've got their own little system working out, sending out signals back and forth. And I'm sure you're going to learn much more cool things like that. And my girl Lee, my girl Lee Tannenbaum, look at her. She's posting links in the chat stream. Go Lee Tannenbaum. So uh, Lee Cuthbert, would you like to play us out and I sing would. us a song about big trees? Guys, you can find all this information on North Fulton Master Gardeners. Google them. Look for their website. They are um, awesome. They're a great friend of ours. And sign up for this webinar because it's going to be awesome. I'm going to take it myself. Lee, play us out. I go to Sandy Springs for many things, but Roswell Road is such a load. I need to unwind and have some downtime. I find myself at the Ripley Big Trees place in Sandy Springs. <laughs> oh, big trees. Oh, big trees. I want to lean against you and feel your leaves. And I want to communicate with your mycelium, mycelium. Humanoid elf. Oh my God, so good. Sign up for the webinar. Thank you, Catherine and Tom. Thank you, North Fulton Master Gardeners. We will see you back here next Thursday night. Goodbye.